Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. This is going to be episode number 504. And this episode is a replay from a couple of years ago. A listener of mine, Matt Gless, drew a sportsman's tag for Desert Bighorn in the Zion unit in the state of Utah. And Matt had a bunch of questions in regards to his hunt. So this is basically a question and answer session where he asked me questions about his upcoming hunt on how to scout, how to evaluate rams, how to handle, you know, people coming to camp and and wanting to enjoy the hunt with him, uh, strategies on how to find big rams, uh, basically anything to do with desert bighorn sheep hunting. I think it can be implied to Rocky Mountain Bighorn or any Bighorn for that matter Uh, and I got a lot of response when I played this episode a couple years ago so I thought I would replay it with sheep season uh, kind of all over the west uh, you know in Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico kicking off. Uh, Utah is already underway but uh, anyway uh, I want to thank you guys for your support of this podcast and I also want to thank the sponsors of this podcast and I get emails from you guys, the listeners, uh, every day asking how you guys can help me. Well, uh, the sponsors make this podcast possible. They make the amount of time that I spend on this podcast possible. So I appreciate uh, if you're in the marketplace for any of uh, anything that my sponsors provide, definitely uh, do your best to support these sponsors. I want to thank specifically GoHunt.com, Cody Nelson, my friend, the glassing guru, the optics authority. He's the new optics manager at GoHunt.com in the gear shop there. You can call Cody directly for info and for sales at 702-847-8747. He's extension 2. Or you can email him directly at optics at GoHunt.com. Now, he will be the one answering the phone. He will be the one answering the emails. And he has promised me that he will take care of the J. Scott Outdoors listeners. So if you're in the market for any optics, any binoculars, spotting scopes, rifle scopes, tripods, any type of gear, anything that you see in the Go Hunt gear shop uh, at GoHunt.com, he can help you with. But specifically, he's the glassing guru and can help you with tripods, anything to do with glassing. He loves to talk glassing. I've had him here on the podcast, and I highly recommend you guys give him a call if you have any optical needs at all. I also want to thank Kuyu.com. That's K-U-I-U.com, Kuyu Ultralight Hunting. Uh, Kuyu obviously is a brand that uh, most everybody knows. If you don't know it, check out Kuyu.com. Check out their incredible gear. Uh, They make the best ultralight hunting gear on the market today. Uh, I've been using them since 2010, and uh, they just make incredible products. I also want to thank CanyonCoolers.com. If you use the J. Scott promo code, you're going to get a 10% discount on all orders. They're based right out of Flagstaff, Arizona, a local company. Go to CanyonCoolers.com. Use the J. Scott promo code. You're going to get a 10% discount. Also, PhoneScope.com. Use the J. Scott 18 promo code to get a 10% discount on all orders. If you've been on my Instagram account, you see all the digiscoping uh, videos and photos. Those are all through my uh, PhoneScope, uh, through my uh, iPhone X and I also want to thank onxmaps.com. Uh, Onyx Maps has just stepped up to be a sponsor of the podcast. Guys, if you're in the market for the best uh, hunting map app out there, Onyx Maps is an incredible tool. I've actually been using it uh, two full seasons now. Uh, I use it a lot over at the Ot6 Ranch. I use it a lot on my uh, guided hunts uh, in Arizona. And um, it's awesome. They have a desktop application. They have a phone application. And uh, it uh, basically replaces the GPS. Um, There's all sorts of applications within the app that you can uh, use to measure distances. There's a breadcrumb feature. There's a private public land feature that actually gives you the name of the the private land owner. It tells you how big the property is. Uh, it delineates the uh, you know the property corners, um, the property lines. It has an aerial 
uh, feature. It has a topo. It has a hybrid feature. Um, just just an incredible app. Go check out onxmaps.com. Use the jscott18 promo code, and you're going to get a 20% discount. Who doesn't like to save money? 20% discount at onxmaps.com. Guys, let's get right to this episode. Again, if you have any questions, comments, anything you want to get off your chest, uh, anything you want to say, you can email me at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. You can also send me a direct message on Instagram. That's at jscottoutdoors. Let's get right to this episode. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today's going to be a fun episode with Matt Gless of Mesa, Arizona. Uh, Matt has drawn the sportsman's tag, I believe, for the Zion unit. Is that correct in Utah? Is it unit specific, Matt, or is it statewide? Uh, no, it's for the uh, Zion unit only. From what I understand, um, the Zion unit is uh, probably the best unit for desert bighorns in um, the state of Utah. And um, Matt has drawn the tag, and he had a bunch of questions he was uh, asking me about desert bighorns. And uh, what I thought is that I would ha- I would record this conversation so that the listeners, anybody out there that has a desert bighorn tag in another state, uh, might have we might have some overlapping questions. Uh, and uh, so I thought it would make a good episode to just record and have Matt ask away and um, hopefully we can bring some value not only to Matt but to other people that have uh, uh, bighorn tags across the United States. So first and foremost, Matt, congratulations on drawing your tag. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was definitely a uh, exciting moment uh, when I found out my wife... Uh, had to kind of smack me because uh, when I found out we were driving and I saw my name and I was like, wait, I can't even believe this. Uh, here's my phone. Does that really say my name? And so That's incredible. So, just, Matt, how old are you? <laughs> I am 37 years old. 37. And so this tag, correct me if I'm wrong, um, you had to go up to the Western Hunting Ex- Expo, uh, Conservation Expo, and you had to apply or put in, I believe it's $5 an application. And, and this is the tag you won specifically for the Zion. Is that correct? Yes, I drew the, uh, it's the non-resident tag. Um, so only non-residents are able to put in for it at the expo. And you do have to show up in order for your, uh, your entry to be uh, validated. Yeah. And it is $5 per hunt. And um, if if are you allowed to put more than one application in for that specific hunt? I mean, can you load the pot in essence for that hunt? Or and if so, did you just buy one ticket, or did you buy a bunch of chances at it? Uh, no, you can only buy one time for each hunt. So I only had my one tag, my one tag in there, and you know, cross my fingers, hoping to win something. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, have you ever been on a desert bighorn hunt uh, prior to this hunt? I have not. Okay. And what is your background as far as hunting? Um, you know, would you would you consider yourself just a de- diehard avid hunter, or are you are you just kind of getting into it, or what what kind of level, or what where what where have you come from in your own hunting? Um, I kind of grew up uh, in uh, Salina, Utah. Um, my dad didn't hunt. None of my brothers hunted. Um, none of my uncles hunted. So I kind of just uh, took wing under a friend of mine, and um, he taught me some things. And then I just kind of did all the studying of how to actually gut an animal uh, before I went out into the field. And so the first time I did it, I'd never seen it done before. Um, and the first thing I shot was an elk, was a cow elk, uh, for, and, uh, it was kind of like a, a, you know, trial by fire for me. Um, but I fell in love with it the first time I actually shot a dove when I was 12 years old and I've been hunting ever since. Uh, some of my family and friends think that I'm kind of just crazy because that's all I love to do. I work to be able to hunt. 
That's awesome. And um, <laughs> that's awesome. That's, uh, so you live in Arizona? Yes, I live in Arizona. And but I travel uh, Monday through Friday for work. Gotcha. And um, what animals do you primarily hunt in Arizona? Um, I love mule deer. Um, absolutely love it. I, I shot a 184 buck uh, two years ago up on the Kayabab. And um, that's, you know, I, I love the way the mule deer look, uh, the hunting of them, um, just trying to find them, especially in like sagebrush is one of my favorite areas to be able to hunt. Um, elk, I have, I've only had one tag of a bull elk hunt, and that's, uh, that was in 27. It was a late hunt, and uh, I tried to make the best of it, and I, I ended up getting one, but uh, it was more of a meat hunt for me at that time, so I lived off uh, my spike elk, and I you know, couldn't say anything better about it. Loved it, and I still actually eat it still because I canned a lot of it. That's great. That's fantastic. Well, let's dive into this Zion hunt that you've drawn, and I'll let you start asking questions. But before we do that, from what I understand, the dates, um, you can hunt both the early and the late hunt. You can hunt both seasons. It's not like a typical governor's tag or something where you can hunt the whole year, but you can hunt during each. I, I take it that there's an early and a late season, and you can hunt both of those seasons until you fill your tag. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, the season starts uh, September 16th, and for me, it goes all the way through uh, November 10th. Okay, and and so, so in other words, the early and late hunt must must back go back to back. In other words, for you, it's an entire season block. Yeah. Yeah, for me, it's an entire season. The first season actually ends October 13th, and then the second season opens October 14th um, through November. Okay. So. Okay, and then um, that that's that's one thing to clarify. And the other thing is, how many tag holders are there on both hunts? In other words, on the early hunt and the late hunt. So, in other words, how many other people are going to be in there hunting while your tag is valid? Um, from what I understand, there's five on each each unit, uh, each time. Okay. So there'll be a total of ten, ten taken. Okay. Um, that that kind of helps me in preparing what I, you know, how I'm going to answer some of your questions. The other thing I would ask is, uh, have you been up there already scouting? Have you looked at the country? I have. I've uh, I've gone up there three times um i've actually talked with quite a few people up there some of the other guides that actually um guide up there i've talked with a few of them um one person that's helped me out a lot and kind of educated me is uh randy johnson who's been on your podcast mm -hmm. Very, great um, guy he's yeah he's a great guy and super knowledgeable um uh, but, I actually got to see his trophy room. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I, I've heard all about it. That, that's fantastic. Um, but just to be clear, you've drawn this tag, and you are going to do this DIY. You're not going to go guided, and, and you want to do this hunt on your own. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. I'm doing it uh, by myself. Um, I might have a couple friends that come up to help uh, glass for me, um, but as a as of right now and for the entire hunt i'll be uh doing it by myself okay awesome awesome well that gives me and the listeners a little bit of a premise there uh, about what we've got going on in your situation and i would say um go ahead and just uh, fire away with any questions that you might have and i'll do my best to um answer the best that i know how okay um one of my uh, first questions is, uh, since my hunt is so long, um, and you know, work is one of those things that kind of, you know, makes it to where you can go or you can't go. So I'm trying to figure out the best time to take the most time off. Um, do you think it'd be beneficial to go towards the beginning of the season or towards the later part when it's a little bit cooler? This is one thing that I would say, um, 
I think you have to lean on the people that you have talked to that either a have been on the hunt or you know have been around the hunt or guided the hunt or know the unit and questions I would be asking them are you know are these sheep rutting um you know, are they sporadic rudders like our sheep in Arizona, you know, pretty much from July all the way into December at any given time, wherever you go throughout, you know, our units, you can find rams that are actively chasing ewes. So a question I would have for the guys that maybe that have specifically been in that unit is ask them specifically, you know, are you seeing a ton of during that period of time is there one period or another that you know you see a lot of chasing you see rams actively pursuing ewes and bouncing around from you group to you group um, and then based on their answer I would probably um, make my decision off of that I can tell you that if it was my tag and if I was able to do quite a bit of scouting up there and I had a particular ram that I wanted to harvest, um, now keep in mind the Zion is, is you know, definitely known as probably the best unit in Utah. So the best, year in and year out, the best rams that are coming out of the state of Utah are going to be coming from this Zion unit. So you have an opportunity to probably harvest a pretty good ram if it were me if it were me i would tell you to go as much as you could on the front side unless someone gave you information that said listen it's much too hot you can't find those sheep like they're really you know hard to find and then all of a sudden you know they show up you know uh you know the last week of october and and you know rut like crazy um i would say go more towards the beginning um in my mind not ever having stepped foot in the Zion sheep are not usually that hard to find um, sometimes it's a function of uh, and I don't know the road structure I don't know anything about the Zion unit but but let me walk through it a little bit with you sometimes if it's super super hot you as a hunter cannot access some of the country and there's not enough water and it's you know much too miserable to, to you know backpack and not have water and, and the logistics of actually hunting early and you know hunting way back deep say in a wilderness area or what have you uh, could prevent you from that I still tell you if it was my tag and there was a certain ram that you wanted to kill I would definitely hunt for sure early um, and then maybe plan on taking a break and then just keep chipping away at it. Um, I always tell people on sheep hunts, you know, no matter where they're at, uh, that you do all of your hunting before the hunt, have the ram you want to harvest picked out and try and shoot them on the first day if you want to kill the biggest rams. Um, now, if you don't have time to really pick through all of the inventory and look at all the rams, then you're just going to have to, you know, go and come and go as as you please. But, um, you know, specifically uh, in Arizona, when we're targeting a certain ram, I would love to have that ram, you know, videoed and and photoed and know that that's the ram I want to kill and you know be sitting on that ram the night before and and try and harvest them the first day um if if scouting if a bunch of scouting is not in the cards for you from a time perspective then i would probably you know plan on going for like the first five days and then maybe take you know a week off and go back for it and just keep hitting it until you get the ram you want okay that's kind of what I was thinking. Um, I just wasn't, uh, I'm trying to, you know, get as much information from everyone that hunts sheep so that I can uh, make that uh, educational guess. Yeah, I think, Matt, I think one of the biggest downsides of if if you were to say, well, I'm going to wait and kind of let, let, you know, the crowd settle down, so to speak, you know, five five tags on each hunt, potentially there could be, you know, five rams before you even show up. If, if if you're looking at this as wanting to try and shoot the best ram you can, I say go early. I say put a lot of scouting time in between now and then and, and do your hunt before the hunt and then, you know, harvest your animal. But look at all the scouting and all the time pre, 
you know ahead of time as that's when you're hunt that's when you're actually doing your quote unquote hunting and then your harvesting is you know the first or second third day of the hunt now on the flip side of that there may be a bunch of people that are you know going to go up there on the first day and shoot a ram and maybe not even a trophy ram and they're gone and they're out of the unit and then you have the whole place to yourself so i've seen it work both ways um but being kind of a um stressed out type a personality that i am i would certainly try and go as much as you can ahead of time i would try and take as much inventory of rams as you could and and you know try and harvest the best ram that you could um, but you may find a ram mm-hmm. that maybe is not the biggest, but he's you know one that you really like, and you you know you've got a real interest in a particular look. Um, yeah. You know, I, th- I think that's okay too. You don't always have to harvest the largest ram. Um, the other thing to look at is age. As sheep hunters, we you know we want to harvest rams that are you know older age class rams and and part of that yep. is talking to the biologists talking to guides talking to other hunters that have hunted in there and and ask them you know and look at the harvest sheet the data sheets you know um what are the other rams that have been harvested in here you know what kind of age do these rams have some units they you know maybe never even get to 10 years old some units they could be you know 13 14 years old this could be a transplant unit um i I remember in 2013 i hunted with brian rimza and in unit 6a and you know there were a a, a few ear tag rams that were part of the original transplant and you know brian's ram was was a ram that actually was born in the unit um so find out all of that information about your particular unit and you know ask biologists are there 10 year old rams are there 12 year old rams like you know what is considered an old ram in this unit um and you may already know the answer to a bunch of that um i have talked with the biologist a little bit um when i get a chance to and uh never really asked the age i know that age is a big thing and I want to get as old a ram as I like as I can find, mm-hmm. um, and that's one thing that uh, with glassing is um, how do you tell exactly how old they are and how close? I mean, is there some kind of facial figures or facial? Uh, yeah, um, for sure. There's some bo- body body char- yeah body characteristics. You you typically can look for a pot belly. <laughs> Um, you can look for a suede back, a pot belly. Um, typically, their rump. There's quite a bit of feedback there. I don't know if the phone um, is the phone stationary on your side over there. Yeah, it is. Okay. Um, is it moving? Yeah, I just hear it's like it's rubbing up against something, but it, it's fine now. Uh, a pot belly, a suede back. You know, um, typically. You want to try and look at rams that are in groups of other rams or with other sheep. Um, you know, you've probably heard it said that you know it's a very scary situation when you have a ram that's all by himself because you have nothing to judge his body size by. And I've seen it mm-hmm. a bunch of times where rams that look big, all of a sudden another ram walks in and you realize that he's a little small-bodied ram. Um, he's got a small head, small face, small body, and you know his 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 horns look big on his head. Um, so I would encourage you to uh, you know look at sheep with other sheep, and um, when you actually look at the horn, um, you want to be able to. Uh, you know count rings the best you can most of the time you have to be you know depending on your optics you got to be you know five six hundred yards away and I try Mm -hmm. and tell people that the uh, the darkest line on a sheep's horn you'll find um, that's their four-year ring and that four-year ring is um, when the the rams first reap their first year of sexual maturity and they put a dark ring on their horn because they actually kind of stress their bodies out and so it creates that dark four-year ring um, and if you can find those four-year rings the further down the horn 
So if you're looking at them from the side, if the four-year ring is kind of, you know, only about two inches from the base, if that makes sense, you know, you're probably yep. only talking about a five-year-old ram, maybe a six-year-old ram. But if you can get that four-year ring, so the most distinguished ring, about ear level or below ear level, you know, that's when you start getting, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, you know, older age class rams. Um, but you can look for that distinguishing dark mark on every sheep. It's usually very distinguishable. And you want to have as much distance from that dark ring um, up to the base of the horn, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, now, do you on the on the horns? Do you want them to pop up? You know, kind of go more uh, upwards, or just go flat back? Okay, and so, then around. So that that's a real um, important question, and I I think to to have the biggest ram possible, what you're looking for is a ram that goes high off of his head, that goes back that drops down and then comes up. What you've got to watch out for is you've got to watch out for those rams that when you're looking at them head on or from the side that they they are kind of a flat top and they kind of go straight from the base, they kind of go straight back. Because that's, you know, a short uh, uh, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line and you want mm -hmm. the opposite of a straight line. You want it to go up back down and up does that make sense because if it just goes yep. flat back it's going to be a shorter distance than if it goes up and then back yeah is, is that did, did i answer that do you have any more questions yeah that 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 that, that answered that um just because uh you want them to go up as far as you can and then as they as they start to curl because i i've noticed that uh the rams in uh, Zion, they flare out also quite a bit. Okay, and that's um, that's something you want to watch too because your flare, um, the flared rams can be very, very deceiving. And, and I know Dar and I, when we were guiding those um, raffle rams, uh, the Nelson eyes up there in northwest Arizona, you know, we had to kind of... Um, kind of redefine how we score and, and how we look at sheep because when those rams really flare when they are when they when you're looking at them from the side you don't uh, you don't get that perfect C you know like the, the C shaped horns that you do with yep. the Mexicana where you can really see it go you know up back and then drop way back down and then come back up you know say you know a tipping up above their jaw when they flare out when they're turned to the side you don't see any of that c in other words they kind of look like bananas on their head instead of the c shape but yeah. one thing you need to know is when they flare out remember the shortest distance between two points is a straight line any the more flare you have the longer your horn is the challenge okay. with flared rams is it's really hard to determine the mass. Um, and I don't want to confuse you, but just know that when they're flared, that means typically more length. But it's also hard to determine how thick the horn is throughout the whole depth of the horn. Okay. But, you know, like um, Claude Warren's big giant Nelson Eye that... that um, he killed, you know, it had a 31 inch tip to tip spread. You get no credit for that. But the, mm -hmm. but the more flare you have, obviously, most of the time, the more length that that horn is going to kick out. Okay. A and so, you know, do you like the super flared look? Is that what you like? And are most of the rams you've seen in Zion, do they have a lot of flare? Uh, most of the rams that I've seen, they have quite a bit of flare. Um, that's one thing that Randy said, too, is that they do have quite a bit of flare. They're not like most. They are Nelsonite in that area also. Mm -hmm. um, and they were they were transplanted from Lake Mead in Nevada. Okay. So back in the 70s. Um, but, 
from what I've seen, like the most of the, the ones that I've seen lately are they're probably like four to five year old Rams. Um, I haven't seen any of the real big Rams yet. Um, just cause I've only had like a day or two as a scout when I'm there. Uh-huh. Um, and so I'm looking for a little bit, you know, a more mature Ram. I, I, I like to flare it out, but at the same time, like, I just want one that, you know, kind of beat up, has his own character, um, you know, kind of just looks like a warrior that's been on the mountain, in my and that, opinion. And that's another way to kind of judge maturity or age. Not always, but a lot of times the Rams with the chips and the dings, um, you, you, you know, and then you see a pot belly, then you see him with other Rams, and you see him with some U's. And you can tell that he's got a big, stocky, blocky shoulders. You know, his, his his got a pot belly. You know, he's just got a big, nice, mature body. Um, that's kind of what you look for. But the other thing is like horn configurations. If you can, you know, uh, go back and look at the harvest sheets. And if, you know, if let's say that the oldest ram harvested in there is 10 years old, like the oldest one you could find, um, you know, that, mm-hmm. that, that probably means, you know, an eight, nine, ten year old ram. If you can find, you know, eight or, or eight or more, that's probably a, a mature ram for that area. You know, if you go back and find that, you know, there's, oh, there's been several 12 year old rams harvested, then, you know, any, anywhere in that, you know, nine, 10, 11, you know, is going to be, uh, a, 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 you know, an old mature ram that you're probably going to want to harvest. Um, and there's no set rule on like, Oh, he's seven years old and he's the giant. You can't harvest them. There's no set rule, but yeah. it's certainly kind of a sheep hunter's um, code to try and harvest the most mature. And a lot of times that means you know horns that are beat up that have character. Um, and and so that's that's good that you're thinking that way. I would tell you, and I'm sure we'll get into it. Um, big rams, big big rams. They, look, they always look big, and if there's any angle where they don't look big, they're probably not that big. So in other words, okay. if you get an angle and, and you know, you, you're you looking at a ram and you can't find any weakness and he just looks just so much bigger than anything else you had seen, he's probably a pretty good ram. And if he's got age, you know, he's definitely one that you would want to put on your you know, on your hit list. The one thing I try and tell people is enjoy this because it's, you know, you very rarely get desert sheep tags or sheep tags in general. But I would go into, if yeah. this tag was mine, I would go into this hunt and I would try and look at as many rams as I could. I would try and photograph and document, photograph and video, you know, with the phone scope and keep track mm-hmm. of every ram. And then by the time your hunt starts, you've looked at a bunch of rams and you have an idea of, okay, this ram I'm looking at right now is bigger than anything I've seen. This is probably a pretty good ram. Now, that can come back to bite you if you only look at six or seven rams and then you go and you see just a decent ram and, you you know, he looks big. If you truly put in a bunch of time, when you find a big one, you'll know it. Um, and, and if you find a giant, you'll really know it cause they look big from every angle. I've, I've never had a big, big ram that didn't look big from every angle. I mean, if, if he does, that should send up red flags that maybe he's not as big as I thought he was. The other thing is okay. if you can get your hands on any records or documentation of any rams that have been harvested and if you can get every photo that you can get your hands on and with your Mm -hmm. ipad or your computer or whatever actually put the age you know whatever information you know about that ram the score the age the bases the first second and third quarters um you know the date that it was shot and have those on your phone so that you have as much record from that unit and and you know every unit is different so you know getting rams from that unit with exactly what the bases were with exactly the first second and third quarters and you know the exact score can really help you when you're in the field because you can reference your phone and go well here's so and so's ram and he had 15 inch bases and this thing you know the one we're looking at right now looks a lot like this 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So trying, yeah. have you been able to get any pictures or any any info on rams that have come out of the unit? Um, not of any of the rams that have been taken out of the unit. Um, I did get uh, with the biologist, and he said that he's yet to see a ram taken under 160. Okay. Um, he says there's quite a few 165s. Um, and that's usually about what people take there. That he said there's some 172s. About four years ago, there was a uh, 178. I believe that's the new state record um, that was taken out of there. Okay. Because um, they just barely start. They just barely opened this unit to hunting in 2009. Okay, so it's 2009. So it's you know it's only eight years old. So I mean, there's there's. Are, are all are there still rams that are ear tagged, or are there any ear tagged rams in the unit? Um, from what I what he said, no. He said there's a there's about 830 30 sheep in that unit, and about half of them are on the Zion uh, National Park. Okay. Um, and so then he said that most of the other places uh, hold about you know, half of what uh, the national park doesn't have just south of there okay. and east of the park also. So what I would do if I were you to put in your notes to double back with him or, or Randy or any of the guides you talk to is try and get any photos you could and try and get – you. It's, it's imperative in my mind that you get base measurements from all the rams that have been harvested so you can kind of get a baseline – and no kind of averages that okay here's a mature ram say eight years or older and the bases are 15 or the bases are 14 and a half or the bases are 14 and if not just one but as many as you can get and go the smallest base recorded okay well that was like a 160 ram but let's say 165 to 172 rams the biggest or the smallest base is 14, the biggest base is, is 15, but there's never been a ram with over 15, that kind of gives you a, okay, if I'm looking at what I think is a giant and, and his bases look huge, I'm not going to plug in a number bigger than 15. Does that, do you get what okay. I'm saying? And then on the yep. bottom side, if there's never been a ram with under 14 inch bases, you can pretty much bet that it's between 14 and 15. And then if you can try yeah. and tighten that range and say most rams that score 165 to 170 in this unit have 14 and a half to 15 inch bases, now you've got an even tighter range of okay, I'm I'm you know that's kind of a range of base right there that I can use as kind of a middle ground when when you're plugging in your numbers and trying to determine what kind of ram you're looking at. Okay. What else you got? Um, and then uh, for your optics, what kind of optics uh, for sheep hunting uh, should anybody carry? Well, in my mind, obviously I don't know your unit, but speaking um, yeah. from, from experience, my mind is you want to cover as much ground as you possibly can i tell people all the time to don't take the coos deer mentality where you want to go up on a point you want to sit there all day what i like to do is go up on a point sit there for an hour maybe two glass in all direction get a feel for it and then move to another point and i want to do that from sun up to sun down one thing about hunting sheep is you can they're not like a deer where they're going to go hide behind the brush and you'll never see them and then all of a sudden they pop out. I'm not saying that it can't be warm and they're going to be bedded on shady slopes and what have you, but typically sheep you can see at all times during the day. So with that being said, you know, I like to run 10s or 10 EL range around my neck um, and then I like to glass with 15 power Swarovskis and then, you know, I've, I, I just sold my Koas, but I for years I used the 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 koa highlander 32 by 82 um and sometimes mm -hmm. those big binoculars are not conducive to you know point hopping and going up and down on points um uh so you know a good pair of 15 binocular 
power binoculars. I like Swarovski. There's other great brands out there. Um, and a good spotting scope. Um, for me, that 95 millimeter Swarovski with the 30 to 70 eyepiece is, um, you know, kind of the cat's meow, best spotting scope I've looked through. I'm able to take really good digiscoping photos, um, you know, with my phone scope adapter um, and with my Swarovski um, TLS APO adapter. Uh, and in my mind, optics is huge because you can age your RAMs, you can score your RAMs, um, you know, use the best binoculars that you can afford, borrow the best binoculars that you can afford. Um, but, you know, I would tell you for sure have something around your neck, you know, that you can be quick glassing and then a 15 power binocular. You know, I don't, the big eyes are not essential. I think 15s are more important or, you know, a good pair of 10 power binoculars or 12s and then have a good spotting scope is, is of up, utmost importance because I think as a sheep uh, guide, as a sheep hunter, you need to dodge and weave because those sheep are doing the same thing. They're con they seem to be constantly moving. They're up, they're down, they're up, they're down. And so it's, it's an awesome animal to hunt because you basically, from the time the sun comes up to the time the sun comes down, you can glass sheep or glass rams at any time of the day. Sheep are also notorious for, it could be blazing hot, and they're just out bedded on a rock in the middle of the sun, just sitting there in the sun, and they act like they could care less. And then I've seen them when it's really hot, you know, glass those shady slopes, and boom, there's three rams, and they're bedded, and they're just in the shade, and... Um, you know, so optics is huge, um, for sure. Okay. And then, um, let's see, we've got quite a few questions that I've written down. Yeah. <laughs> and as we're going through, um, how many way, how many different ways do you want to look at a ram? As much as I possibly can, I want every angle, but if I, if, if, if you said, Jay, if you could just have one, one look at a ram to determine if he's what I'm looking for or not, I want head on. I want head on and what I'm looking for, and if you're talking about Nelson eye sheep, I'm looking for what we talked about before. I'm looking for big bases. I'm looking for um, a horn that goes high off the head. I'm looking for a horn that drops down so when he's dead on facing you, I want that horn to go up, I want it to go back, and then I want to see that drop. And if you could say take a yardstick and put the yardstick in essence underneath each horn so the ram's facing me, I set a yardstick underneath there and if there's distance between the bottom part of his chin, if there's air, if there's an air gap in other words, if you draw a straight line between the bottom of the horns, mm -hmm. you know, put a yardstick there, that's good drop. Yeah. That's what you want to look for. Y y if, if the bottom of the horn comes level with the jaw, that's, that's not as good. You want that horn to drop as low as you possibly can. Now, there's one thing to watch out from that head-on view. If they are flat off their head and they have good drop, that's not as good sometimes as a ram that goes up out of his head and then comes down and has decent drop. Does that make sense? I've seen rams yeah. that have really good drop, but they are flat as can be off their head. And you got to watch that. Um, and with those Nelson eyes, a good amount of flare, you want to look for a you know good amount of flare. Um, but overall, mass is everything. You want to look for as heavy a ram throughout the whole horn. But generally, it has to start with big bases. So if I could give you any bit of advice, you want to find a ram that has the biggest bases. So starts with the biggest circumference of any other ram out there. And if you can find okay. that, if he's got the length, he's, he's probably going to be a really good ram. Because it's pretty rare that they have big, giant bases and then all of a sudden they peter out at the end. You've seen it. We've all seen it. But you got mm -hmm. in, a good rule of thumb is if you start big, you're going to finish big. If you start okay. with a small base, you're going to you're going to just taper down, and mass is 60% of your score. So 
Um, big basis is everything. But back to your question of, I, if I only had two looks, I'd want front on and I'd want a perfect side view. Now with the Nelson Eye Sheep, the side view, like I said, is very, very deceiving because, you know, um, Darn I guided a ram that had a 40 inch horn and when you looked at him from the side, you couldn't see that whole C shape because half the horn was pointing out at you. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Instead of like a Mexicana where you can see it go, you know, up out of his head, back, drop down and, you know, come up and you can go, wow, he's, you know, he comes way up over his, over his, you know, the top of his nose. Those big Nelson eyes flare out and there's, you know, there's 39 inches of horn pointing straight in your direction and it's deceiving. So front on yeah. and to the side is, is number one. So if you were telling me, Jay, I'm taking pictures of rams and I'm going to send them to you or I'm going to send you video, I and which mm -hmm. people send me all the time. And what I would tell them is I want front on and I want the side. And then any other angle you can get is great. But front on and the side is huge. And then mm -hmm. I want to look at the back of the horn also for any chips or major dings. And we're fortunate in Arizona we have such good quality sheep that, um, you know, maybe some ram, you know, there's two rams standing right next to each other. They look about the same size. Well, one of them in the back of his horn has a huge dent that's going to be right in one of the quarter measurements. And say one of my hunters says, hey, I want to book ram. Well, if I know that that quarter measurement is going to fall right in that biggest chip, I may ha say, hey, I just want to let you know that quarter measurement is going to fall in that chip. You might want to shoot the other ram because you told me you want a 168 or better ram, and you got to watch. You got to watch big dings and dents uh, and chips in those quarter measurement areas. Okay. Sounds good. Um, and then some of my other questions are more about. Uh, actually going out there. Um, I'm going to be shooting my 30 out six. Um, it's not a long range gun. Um, I know that there's other calibers out there that I've been looking around. What is your favorite caliber for sheep hunting? Well, I have to say that I have not drawn a tag myself for sheep. Um, I am going doll sheep hunting next summer in the Northwest Territories. Uh, but I would tell you that before I would go out and buy a new gun, I would make sure that my optics were up to par. If 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 you're, uh, it, my answer would be if if you're capable with your 30 out six and you're you're comfortable with it, I would I would much rather see you put a good scope on the gun, or I would much rather see you upgrade your optics, your binoculars, your spotting scope, or your you know your digiscoping system. And have that dialed in more than spend the money on the gun. Um, going back to your question, you know, any any lightweight flat shooting gun. You know, I'm a 257 Weatherby guy. I really like that. Um, any of your 300 caliber um, guns uh, are are fine. Sheep are not, you know, known for being very, you know, tough animals, so to speak, when you shoot them. And I don't think. Sheep are one of those animals, and this is going to sound kind of funny, but sheep are one of those animals that you want to make sure you get in close enough and you make your first shot count because you don't want to have a ram falling off a ledge. You don't want to have a ram breaking his horn. So I, if it were me, I would try and plan on you know getting in that you know 250 to 300 yards and a 30-odd six. I mean, you've probably had that gun for a long time and you're comfortable with it. I, I wouldn't, I would just, you know, you're close enough now to the season. I don't know that I would, um, you know, switch to, to uh, you know, a 300 or, or a 7 millimeter or, or you know, even a, two, a 270 or a 257 or, you know, 6.5 Creedmoor. Um, I would probably just stick with the gun you have uh, and just be proficient with it. And, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend doing any long range shooting at sheep i think you need to get in fairly tight to them and um you know make your first shot count and i think your 30 odd six will be fine okay sounds great um <clears throat> yeah I, i've shot it for a long time and i upgraded my scope a while ago perfect on my gun so it's made it very uh, very efficient for me 
Um, and I also do all my own reloading, so I know exactly where it's shooting and how Perfect. it's shooting. I wouldn't change a thing. Um, I, I wouldn't change a thing. Okay. Um, and I know you're a big Kuyu guy. I love Kuyu also. Um, for these for these warmer um, type hunts, do you have any recommendations on gear um, from Kuyu or any other uh, gear that you think uh, should go in your backpack when you're out? Well, I I are you going to be backpacking at all in this unit, or is it pretty much um, uh, hunting from camp and hitting different areas and day hunting? Um, there's going to be some backpacking depending on which area I'm going into, um, cause some of it is wilderness. Um, and so, um, I've gone in a couple days here and there and then come back out to base camp. Mm -hmm. Um, that's probably what I will be doing is one or two days out, um, depending on the water sources and everything also. Okay. So for pants, um, the, the pants that I really, really like. Are the for warm weather are the Tiburon pants. Uh, the Tiburon pants have that air dock technology. Uh, I love those pants. I wear them on archery elk hunts and you know spring turkey hunts. Certainly, if Arizona's sheep season was uh, you know mid September through uh, the beginning of November like this, I would certainly look at um, potentially Tiburon pants. Uh, and potentially attack pants, which is the next pant up. Um, it's probably the most versatile pant that Kuyu makes. Um, but if you're looking at really warm temperatures, you can't beat the Tiburon pant. Uh, like I said, then the attack pant, and then you know maybe towards the end of the season uh, in what is it, November 10th? I think you said it goes yeah. to. Um, yep. You know, if you've got cold weather, if you've got snow, uh, the attack, or excuse me, the guide pant, which has a fleece lining, uh, those are the pants that I wear uh, on my later season hunts uh, when it when it's cooler and cold outside. Uh, you know, the with the fleece lining, and they they're they're really durable. Um, back to the mm -hmm. Tiburon pant, I don't know the country they're on the Zion. Uh, but if you've got a lot of real nasty brush and stuff and you're going to be constantly fighting the brush, uh, Tiburon might not be your best. It might be the best for warm weather, but it might not be the best for durability. Um, you probably go with the attack pant, you know, right down the middle of the road um, pant. Uh, it's the most versatile pant they have, a little more durable than the Tiburon. Um, and all of those pants have the side hip vents that you can, you know, zip about from, say, just below your belt um, uh, and then running down the side of your leg down to about your knee. You can vent those pants, um, which is a nice feature there. Uh, th that covers the pants. Uh, we, we should talk about boots. Uh, I don't know what yep. boots you're wearing. Uh, I just I switched over to these uh, Kuyu Rebel Ks, the Scarpa Rebel Ks, uh, and I've got about a hundred miles on my uh, uh, Rebel Ks. They're super um, lightweight. Um, they've been extremely durable so far. I'm wearing them on a mountain goat hunt here coming up. Uh, I leave on the 11th of August. Um, mm -hmm. They're really stiff sold. Um, so I I think. I've been wearing them here in Colorado training, getting ready for the mountain goat hunt, and um, I think they're going to be great for technical climbing, you know, side hilling with weight, you know, talus slopes and what have you. Um, yep. I, I would look at that. Uh, you know, th those Kuyu boots, I really like them. I think I'm, you know, obviously I need to go on this mountain goat hunt to give you the, you know, 100% yes, they're the, the ticket. But so far in my training and what have you, I, I really like them. Now, I will tell you, I typically am not a huge stiff boot proponent because a lot of my hunting isn't in super steep country. So it's been a little bit of adjustment for me to get used to the super stiff sole. Um, but, you know, like today I climbed, you know, almost 2,000 foot of elevation and got to about 10,500 feet. And, um, you know, any time that I'm doing real steep cutting across slopes and, and such, um, They've performed very, very well, and uh, you know I think packing out a mountain goat, I think they're going to be good. Um, you, you know, there's other boots out there for sure, but I'm I'm kind of high on these um, Kuyu, um, these uh, Rebel Ks right now. 
Yeah, and for me, uh, when I first found out, I knew boots were one of the first things that I really needed to get so I could start breaking them in. And I actually went with the uh, the new uh, Mountain Hunter from Lace Up and Sons. Okay, good, good. I've I've heard a lot of good things about them. Um, what has been your experience? Um, I love them so far. I mean, I I wear them even though I'm in flat country, uh, Missouri, right now. Um, I try to wear them as much as I can, um, usually on a treadmill or out walking around with my pack on, uh, as much as I can, even, you know, even though it's on concrete, um, not too many hills around here. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, even when I was up in, uh, Idaho on my, uh, in-laws ranch, uh, wearing them up there, very comfortable going up and down the mountains, um, very comfortable, you know, side hilling, um, haven't had a blister with them yet. Uh, don't know if that's because I haven't had them on long enough or just uh, my feet. I walk around barefoot a lot and wear sandals a lot, so my feet are kind of rough. So maybe that helps with the, uh, for sure not getting blisters. <laughs> for sure. And <laughs> but, I would uh, tell you, um, have some Luco tape. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Luco tape, but um, have some Luco tape, uh, you know, definitely in, you know, in your truck or in your camp so that if, you know, you do start feeling hot spots or something, you can apply that. One thing I like about Luco tape is, you know, you can wear it and, I mean, it'll stay on for like a week, like, or, or more. I mean, it's, once you put it on, it's, it's pretty much on. Um, and if you get hot spots, you can, you know, I always carry a a roll of luco tape in my pack and if i start feeling a hot spot i immediately just stop and um you know put it on and it sticks really really well to your feet you know even when your feet get clammy um and you know try and protect your feet as as good as you can i'm glad you found a boot that you like um, maybe have a pair of backup boots too just in case if you need to rotate boots um and you know take care of your feet for sure um, yeah, and I, I do have a backup boot, and that's I wear the um, Q4, the Quest 4 Solomons are my backup boot. Okay, so you know, just just kind of monitor how you're doing. The last thing you want is have you know blisters or something go wrong with your hunt that's going to affect the outcome of your hunt. So just protect your feet. Um, back to your question about the Kuyu, um, you know, I I love merino wool. Um, even here fishing, you know, I'm, I'm constantly wearing a uh, Kuyu Merino 145 zip tee, uh, the, the, the ultra merino uh, tops. I wear those hunting. Uh, I always wear a long sleeve shirt, even in warm weather, uh, just just to keep the sun off me. I'm, the sun hammers me pretty good, so I, I try and cover up as much as possible. Um, I really like that shirt. Um, uh, big fan of the um, Kuyu uh, Ultra Down, the the uh, the Super Down, uh, the new jacket that's come out. I want to say it's like eight ounces. It's ridiculously light. That that always goes in my pocket or in my pack unless it's just a you know super hot hunt um, because it's so mm-hmm. light you don't even know it's there. Um, I really like that. And then I like some of the new Peloton stuff. I've got a Peloton 240 hoodie. Um, that's kind of an all-around. I've been wearing it fishing, you know, cool mornings and stuff with the hood. With the hood, um, and um, uh, really like that. Uh, another thing, like the guide glove. Um, those guide gloves by Kuyu are are really good. You know, when you're hiking around in the rocks, which you'll be doing on the sheep hunt, having a good glove. Um, there's also the Tiburon glove, so it's made out of the same material on the top part of your hand. That's you know breathable. And then there's, um, uh, you know, it's got the, I think it's petard leather. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's real grippy. Um, but I, I wear primarily like the guide gloves. Um, and I know Randy, he, he usually wears gloves too. And when you're in and out of the rocks, you know, you just get, it, it just protects your hands. I think that's important for sure. Oh, yeah. Um, and then, um, Safety equipment in your pack when you're out hiking around. Do you carry certain things? Uh, you carry one of the, uh, I think it's called a spot, um, to let people know everything's okay or anything like that. Well, and you I, don't have cell phone service. Yeah, I actually, um, uh, I actually carry the spot uh, device, which you you can basically have pre-recorded messages, which 
I have one that just basically says honey I'm fine and I can turn it on and hit the button that says OK and it'll actually send whoever you choose you can send to an email and it gives your exact coordinates and um, I can just leave that on and then you know every once in a while send it and I can turn it off as well but I can send my wife you know everything's great messages as well as I have the um, Global Star uh, satellite phone and like on this mountain goat hunt I'll take the spot and I'll take my um, spot uh, you know my Global Star uh, spot satellite phone um, and be able to check mm -hmm. check in uh, but yeah any of those devices uh, I don't know what the cell service is like up there on the Zion uh, but anytime you can check in uh, back home and 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 for me uh, being able to check in allows me to be gone even longer um, if she knows that I'm safe, then then she's your know, her mind's at ease, and you know I can go day in day out, week in week out, you know sometimes a month, and and she knows that everything's okay. And then um, you can also rent satellite phones. It's not that expensive, um, depending on how much of this hunt you're going to be in the backcountry. It might be something you look at, at uh, as well. Okay. That's good information on the, the renting of the satellite phone. Yeah, I, I do want to um, say what one kind thing. of mapping system do you use? Oh. I do want to say one thing, and then I'll hit on the mapping system. I had heard you said you might have a few friends um, come up, and I'll tell you as well as anybody listening that has a sheep hunt. Uh, when you draw your tag, it's very, very typical as a guide. I hear it all the time. Oh, my buddies are coming up. They're going to come help on the hunt. And I will tell you that 99% of the time, a lot of those buddies never show up. They get, you know, tied up with this, you know, this um, responsibility or what have you. So I would be right now, Matt, I would be, you know, trying to determine which friends are coming up and when they're coming up and maybe stagger some of them. Once you find out, once you realize when you're going to hunt, maybe kind of stagger them. So maybe you have a buddy come for three days and then another buddy come for three days. So, you know, you're not alone. Um, uh, we're, you know, rather than having all five guys come at the same time, that that's one mm -hmm. train of thought to maybe stagger them. Um, and then the other thing, uh, and, and this, this applies to you, I'll say it, but I'm mainly saying it for the other listeners out there that have sheep tags. One thing about having buddies come on a sheep hunt, sometimes it can be detrimental in a way. If you're trying to harvest a big old mature ram and you have people that don't know what they're looking at, if they don't have a phone scope or a way to take pictures or video through their spotting scope or through their binoculars and they're off glassing somewhere else, and they come back and say, oh, I saw a ram. Well, how big? Well, I don't know. If, if anybody that's coming up, in my opinion, on a sheep hunt with you, you should find out what binoculars and what spotting scope they have. And if they don't already have a way to digiscope through their optics so that they can bring you back good intel and good information and say, well, I don't know how big he is, but here's a video of him and let you see them, they're, they're really sometimes a hindrance because if you're looking for a specific ram or say your top five rams and either A, you don't have photo documentation or video documentation to give them or they don't have the ability to bring a video back to show you, you don't know what you're looking at. And you're, then you're like, and they're, oh, it's a big one. It's a giant. Well, where's the photos? Well, I don't have photos. And then you go over there. They've never looked at sheep. And all of a sudden, you waste a day. You pull out of your high country or your wilderness camp. And you come out. And you go to look at the ram they're looking at. And it's, you know, a, 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 a medium-sized ram. And they're like, there he is. And you're like, where, where from the medium ram? That's him. I've, I've seen it over and over and over it can hinder you so a bit of advice I'd give you is make sure everybody that's coming has some ability to document what they're seeing the other thing is you should have photos and video on your phone 
and you should screenshot you know you know be watching a video on your phone be able to screenshot it and be able to everybody that comes that helps have pictures of target rams that you're saying if you see that one i want to know because i want to shoot that ram then they're like they can match up chips even if they don't know sheep very well if if they spend enough time looking at them and they're looking at through their spotting scope and then looking at their phone they can be like that's the ram matt wants to shoot like we need to get him over here that's when they can become a huge help to you if they can't okay. tell you what they're looking at it, it becomes a goat you know you're chasing ghosts you don't know what they're looking at okay sounds good um that's good information because, yeah, I mean, I understand that life happens and, you know, people can't come last minute or, you know, they might have drawn a hunt that's during the same time. So I I completely understand that. Uh, and and um, one thing I'll add to, sometimes the biggest help is guys going the opposite direction. It's so easy to want to go with the hunter and go with you on your sheep hunt, but sometimes there can be more help going like Dara and I, we very rarely, very rarely ever go together. We go in opposite directions. We don't want to cover okay. the same country. We want to cover different country. And then he comes back and reports to me. I come back and report to him. We, you know, maybe talk on the cell phone during the middle of the day. I send him a text. He sends me a text like... People out there that are listening, if you've drawn sheep tags, the best thing people can do that are coming to help you is not go right along with you. It's to go to a completely new area, tell them, hey, go up, don't interfere with any other hunters, go sit up on a point, tell me what you see, send me a picture, text me a photo of the ram you're looking at, send me a video of the ram you're looking at, and you can eliminate country by sending them off as little scouts or little drones so to speak and then you don't have mm -hmm. to necessarily go there there is one drawback to that if you send someone that's not a hard charger or that you, you know doesn't glass efficiently or doesn't take their time and you know maybe doesn't have the skill set you do you can send someone to an area and they go i didn't see anything well, you didn't see anything well how long well i stayed there for like 20 minutes i didn't see anything so i you know i i moved well, okay, but in your mind, you're going, well, did they really cover the country or, you know, did they just look, they didn't see anything, so they really never even set up and really pounded it out. So the people that come help you, you have to communicate with them and be like, okay, I want you to go to this area and I want you to sit there for like an hour. And I don't care if you don't see anything in 20 minutes, I want you to wait an hour, glass the entire area, then move on. And the, the more you can communicate with your team or people helping you, the better off it's going to serve you and, 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 you know, serve your purpose of trying to, you know, they all want you to get the best RAM you can. But you, oh, have, yeah. to, you have to kind of line them out and be like, okay, you're, I want you to look at five primary, primary areas today. I want you to spend at least one hour in each area. Well, I didn't see anything after 10 minutes, so I moved. No, you know, like, cover it so that i can know that that area is covered because sheep are so nomadic they're not like a coos deer mat where they like have a canyon and that's the canyon they live in they're born and raised and they die in that canyon sheep wander yeah. here and there and all over so half the battle with sheep is since they're moving so much you have to move and you have to be constantly you know like oh he was here he was here he was here so he's like on a path you know they're not like a coos deer like oh i'm gonna sit up on this point and i know this buck is in this canyon and he's here well no a sheep you could potentially glass the canyon for an hour and nothing's there because they're on the back side of the ridge or they're three ridges over you've got to constantly be moving but you need to sweep the country and efficiently find everything that's there then move on and keep moving and moving and moving and anyone that helps you should do the same thing okay and then as you say sweep the country um when you're scouting on top of that how about trail cameras are those helpful on a sheep hunt 
here we go trail cameras um <laughs> i think in the right country they can be helpful certainly i say any documentation so my goal when i when i either am guiding in a unit or you know when i draw my tag someday i my goal is i'm going to want to see every ram in the unit now, yeah. when you tell me that there's 800 sheep in the Zion and half of them are on the national park, obviously that's probably not feasible. Okay, but in uh, yep. for other people out there listening that have a unit that's you know a, an isolated mountain chain and you can put a camera on a drinker and get photos of every single sheep in the unit, therefore you've documented and have or have more documentation yes i think they can be extremely helpful um i don't know the zion unit i don't know if there's live water everywhere um you know sheep don't need that much water as it is i don't know if there's drinkers there and i would ask the biologists like you know for one is it legal just make sure it's legal everybody that's different states you know there's different rules whatever make sure it's legal mm -hmm. and then say you know do these sheep do they do they water in seeps do they water in springs do they water in game and fish catchments you know is there live creeks if there's live water i'm betting that trail cams are going to be pretty pretty tough to get pictures of rams if you've got units that the water it's very arid and there's no live water there's no tanks it's all game and fish drinkers then yeah, I think having cameras up on Game and Fish Drinkers would be a huge tool to be able to take inventory of the sheep. Now, I will say personally, it's kind of getting to that point where it's like borderline. To me, I'm old school. I'm a glass them up. I'm not going to say that I haven't used trail cameras because I have before. Mm -hmm. I'm wrestling with the whole thing right now because I, I'm not sure where I stand. I almost think it's somewhat getting borderline like we've cooked it too much we've talked about it on this podcast before with like man we we always seem to overcook everything and not that cameras in in their own right are problematic where they become problematic let's say is if all five of or all 10 of the zion sheep hunters had cameras on one tank and all of a sudden they're going in and out of that tank to check it and they change those sheep's pattern that's where okay now maybe we've gone we've got a problem so yeah i can't answer your question on the trail cameras on the zion i can tell people that in you know a lot of the other states nevada um, arizona california in places in units where there is no live water they can be extremely effective for sure to take inventory yeah. of your unit yeah from what i know i'm talking with biologists and being up there They've been getting a lot of uh, monsoon storms, and the biologist said it's great for the sheep, but it's going to make it harder on the uh, hunters because there's going to be a lot more water than there normally has been in the past. Yeah. So now, that 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 was kind of one of my my things is, you know, maybe put them in an area that I might want to look at, but I wouldn't not waste always there. It. I personally, from the sounds of it, you know, with potholes and monsoons and it being that early, um, I wouldn't waste a lot of time with cameras. Certainly, if you find an area that, you know, is getting pounded, it doesn't hurt to throw one up if it's legal, for sure. Um, I would mm -hmm. say go into that with a mentality that you want to glass up every single sheep in the unit and you're going to dodge and weave and move all day until you see as many rams as you can. Because in my mind... The best way for you to shoot the biggest and most mature sheep is for you to look at as many rams as you can so that when you finally find what you think is the oldest, what you think is the biggest ram in the unit, you know it. So you can say, I need to stop looking. This is him. I need to shoot him. But if you've only seen yep. six rams, it's kind of hard. If you've seen, you know, if, if the biologist says there's 80 rams, or excuse me, 800 sheep, and he says there's... 200 rams in the whole area then you need to start taking inventory and say here's ram one one two three four five here's herman here's joe blow start nicknaming them whatever and go okay before the hunt started i've seen 60 rams or i've seen yeah. i've seen 40 rams or i've seen 100 rams and this is the best one well you're probably looking at a pretty good ram 
I would yeah. challenge you to go into this literally, and I'm obsessive. People are like, you're you're out of your mind. Like you get just, <laughs> I get one track mind. But like this is a chance of a lifetime, and you're in mm-hmm. the state of Utah in the best unit. Like you have a chance to kill a book ram, and maybe better. You know, over 168. You know, they killed it. You said a 178. Like I would yep. I would be scouting and spending. You know. I would blow a bunch of time scouting trying to determine what is the biggest ram. I would be talking to anyone that I know, what have you seen? Do you have any photos? What did you see last year? I would talk to the hunters that hunted it last year. I'd call every single one of them. I'd call. Mm-hmm. I'd talk to the hunters that hunted two years ago. I'd talk to every single one of them. And they might say, hey... I shot a really good ram, but I saw a giant, and here's a picture of him. And then you've got a photo, okay? Yeah. Watch out for okay. the, you know, oh, I saw a giant, and, you know, I killed a one, I killed a 160, but I saw a giant. Well, you know, you have to take everything, you know, do you have a picture of it? Do you have a video yeah. of it? And, you know, the other thing I just popped in my mind, I don't even know if this is legal, but in the Zion National Park, if half the sheep, is it legal to go to the park and look at sheep in the park? Is it legal to go and look at sheep that are close to the boundary of your unit? Because if you've got ewes on public and there's a big ram on the park, if it's legal, I don't know if it is. Never even been yeah. to Zion, so I don't know. the. But go look at it if it's legal. Go in the park as, and because those sheep could move 5, 10, 15 miles, 20, 30 miles to come rut. Oh, yeah. So if you're like, there's six rams within two miles of this U group that's are, that are giants, and you've got both hunts, and someone's telling you, hey, the last two weeks of the hunt, they're rutting around like crazy, then there's a pretty good chance that one of those six giants are going to come off the park and come you know into your into the area you can hunt so i mean if you can mm-hmm. take inventory on the park i would do that as well okay yeah i'll find out i mean i'm sure it's just like yellowstone where you can look at all the animals <laughs> yeah i mean it find you know? out and i would i would be looking uh, if it were i'm just speaking if it was my tag I would be talking yeah. to anybody that I know. I'd be looking at any photos that I could look at. I'd be documenting bases, first, second, and third quarter uh, measurements on every horn. I'd be trying to establish what is kind of a baseline of, you know, a good ram in this unit. Like XYZ's ram had, you know, was 37 inch horns and had 15 inch bases and had, you know, nine and a half inch third quarters. And here's a picture of it. Granted, maybe it's not a live photo, but here's their harvest photo. And then I actually put on the actual picture, and I do it either with my iPad or you know, any editing program, and do left side, base, 15, first quarter, 14 and a half, third quarter. And I, or, you know, I put all of the measurements, total mass, total length. So that when I'm looking at a ram, I'm like, man, this is a really good ram. Man, this looks like so-and-so's ram. Or, you know, her ram or his ram or Joe Blow's ram. This is really close ram. Mm-hmm. What did Joe Blow's ram score? What were the links? Well, this one yeah. that I'm looking at, look, he's a little bit shorter than this one. and But, okay, he looks like he's about 36. He looks like he's about 37. But in until you have those numbers from those prior rams harvested, you're just throwing numbers out in the wind. But if you can actually yeah. have... You know, two, three, four, eight, however many Rams photos and be like, here's Joe Blow's 164. He had 14 inch bases and he was 34 inches long. Here's, you know, Joe X's, you know, 171 Ram and he had 38 inch horns and, you know, 15 and a half inch bases. Then you at least have something to go off of. Okay. Most definitely. What else you got? Um, mapping systems. Okay. Um, what kind of mapping system do you use? I use Onyx Maps. Uh, is there another 
uh, mapping system that uh, is better or I, is good? Onyx maps are good because it shows, obviously, the private and the public. Um, and the mapping system that I use is Phil Endicott's uh, Topo map. You can get the app uh, online at $7.99. I have no affiliation with it, but it's Phil Endicott with an E. Um, and it's actual the USGS topo maps on your phone. Uh, and it, it doesn't show private and public as good as the Onyx map, but it gives you the exact topographical map. And I'm a topo map junkie. Um, and with your phone, just like on the Onyx, you can hit the button where it shows your exact location. Um, mm -hmm. the, those are the, the maps that I use on all my hunts in the United States. I use that Phil Endicott, and you can load per state. Um, you can load all the USGS maps, uh, you know, depending on if, if you're hunting Utah, you probably just want to go and, you know, whatever Zion units, you know, maybe there's four or five or six or eight, whatever topo, um, you know, one to 2,400 or one to 24,000 um you know, it, it, it's, I, I'm a topo map junkie. Um, it doesn't show mm -hmm. you any aerial or anything like that. And I think I used to use a thing called Trimble Outdoors um, Backcountry Navigator, I think is what it was called. And it I could flip from the topo to the aerial, back to the topo, back to the aerial, which I believe Onyx Maps does as well. Um, mm -hmm. it, that's a huge tool. I'm a, I, I use Google Earth a ton. So... If, yeah. if, if I had drawn the Zion unit on my home computer, I would have my Google Earth program pulled up. I would dr delineate where the national park boundary is. I would highlight in every single road. I would um, correlate my uh, coordinates of places that I've been, people that I've talked to. Um, I, I basically go on and any unit that I hunt, any animal that I hunt, like last year I hunted the beaver unit in Utah for elk, like I label all yep. the roads, I do it all myself. I, I label, you know, Indian reservation here, uh, national park here, state land here, private land here, this road, that road, and I'm a, I'm a Google Earth junkie. Uh, but when I get mm -hmm. in the field, I go, uh, I go back to the Phil Endicott uh, topo. Uh, app. Okay, and are you able to use that when you don't have service? Yes, you're able to use it when you don't have service. Uh, it will uh, use the GPS locator on your, uh, you know, on your phone, and it will pinpoint. Mine does with the with the blue dot where I'm at. Um, mm -hmm. And yes, you can use it without service because you preload the map. So when you go on the app, I believe it's $7.99. You go on and, in other words, you can download maps and then erase maps and then, oh, I drew as, you know, uh, say a 13B turkey tag in Arizona and then I erase it and two years later I got a 13B deer tag. I can go back and, um, you know, upload those maps. So once you buy the app, okay. you can, we're getting some feedback on the phone there. I don't know if it's brushing up against something. Okay, what else you got, Matt? Um, that's uh, I think that's about it uh, about uh, my my sheep hunt. Um, we've you, answered a lot of the questions ahead, and you were asking me, um, or I saw you had sent me, um, uh, how long would you stay on a ram once you find it? Um, oh yeah. How many rams would you look at before you take them? Do you want other rams around him to really get a better idea of how big he is compared to others? Um, th your question about how long would you stay out on a ram once you find it, uh, I, I want to cover that a little bit because it's real easy to go up scouting and you find a pretty good ram and then you get it in your head that that's the biggest ram and that's the ram you want to kill, which is fine. That's perfectly fine. The way I look at it is I try and take as many photos, get in pretty tight, take as many photos and get as good video as you can and then move out, try and keep tabs on that ram, and, but then I use that ram as a benchmark. I'm going to use that ram okay. as a benchmark and then try and go and pound the country to find a ram that's bigger than that one. 
If I can't find a RAM, then I can always try and come back to that RAM. One thing you have to be careful of is those RAMs are, and I'm speaking from experience in Arizona mostly, but they're moving around so much, sometimes they're very hard to keep track of. And I always say the, the best the worst place to look for a big ram is the last place you saw them. <laughs> they always are on the move. But that's where when you've documented and you've taken inventory in your unit, you know there he is. I haven't seen him for seven days and he just turned up and that's the biggest ram I've seen my entire scouting. That's the one I want. When you don't have good photos, you don't have good videos, they all look the same. You, okay. you follow what I'm saying? I follow exactly and, what you're saying. But also, don't fall into the trap of finding one good ram and being like, I'm just going to stay on them until the hunt starts, and you go in the same spot, and you go and look for that ram. Use him as a benchmark, but then put him up against... So match your photos and video of that ram against everything else until you find a bigger one. Then you find one, you're like, whew, this one's bigger than that one. So now you have two that are candidates. Don't get stuck on one. Keep looking, keep looking, keep looking. Okay? I've got two rams. I've looked. I've seen 76 rams. These are the two biggest. You know, then you can pretty much say, well, I've got two rams. Those are the two biggest I've seen. And then comes the discipline part. Once you've found a couple that you know are big and you know are bigger than anything you've seen, if you have time, if you can help it, have the discipline to stay with it. The ram is alive. Wait them out until you can find them and shoot them. What people do is they get responsibilities at home. They get, you know, whatever, their job, whatever, and they end up shooting a ram. And I talk to them all the time. And people say, well, I didn't shoot the one I wanted to shoot, but I got a good one. Fight that urge to be like, nope, there's two rams in here. Or there's one ram. Say you see a ram early that's bigger than anything you've seen. Well, if it were me, yeah. I'm going to wait till the very last possible minute that hoping that that thing shows up to kill him. Because that's how you kill a giant. Is you, Claude Warren's biggest, the biggest Nelson I ever shot in the state of Arizona. We didn't harvest him to 14 days after the first time I saw him. And we kept looking and looking and looking and looking. And I knew he was there. I had photos and video. I didn't know how big he was. I knew he was big. But I knew yeah. he was there. And Claude wanted him. So we stuck it. And we kept kept glassing, kept glassing, kept glassing, kept moving, dodging and weaving until we found him. And that's how you kill a giant. These guys that kill giant stuff, they, they don't give in. They stick it out. I can give people out there listening some advice on, you know, these what I would call unbelievable trophy once in a lifetime hunts. I don't know your situation at home, Matt. I'm talking to listeners out there as well. You guys have drawn sheep tags. Like you need to communicate with your loved ones that this is a big deal. This is something that will only happen to you once. Maybe if you draw in Arizona or another state, maybe twice in your life. And if you're, you know, super type A, stressed out, you know, go get them personality like me, to a fault sometimes, I'm going to admit. Um, you have to explain to your loved ones, like, this is my chance to do it. This is my chance to rise above. This is my chance to do something special. It's very important to me. I love you, I know the kids, and you know all of that whole thing, but this is a once-in-a-lifetime deal, and it's your chance to shine. And if I can encourage anyone out there to, if you find something big, keep hunting until you kill it, until the very last second. And everybody's got their own sense of responsibility, everybody's got their own things going on. But if you communicate way before the season starts, way before the hunt starts, and and lay the groundwork that you're going to do whatever it takes, and you're going to give it your 110% effort, you're more than likely going to come out with the, the biggest trophy of your life um, if you go in and into these hunts with that mentality. Okay. 
Yeah, and that's that's one thing. My, I, I married a great wife. Um, she uh, she understands that this is a once in a lifetime hunt, and even though she's pregnant right now, she's like, "You go and spend as much time as you need." <laughs> well, and I think that um, that that's awesome. I mean, you're in a situation where, you know not not everybody's in and i think a lot of it comes down to communication and a lot of it comes down to you know what there's a time to hunt and there's a time to be with your family and when you're with your family you're with your family when it's time to hunt it's time to hunt and so much you know so much of of people's time is taken up with their their passions and their love and then they don't spend good time with their family and i'm not speaking to you matt i'm speaking to the listeners you know, yeah. when, when it's time to do things with your wife, when it's time to do things with your kids, when it's time to be a dad, when it's time, whatever, to be a mom, do it. Do it 100%. But lay the groundwork that there's a few circumstances that come up, and when they come up, you're going to give it everything you got, and you're going to, you find a giant ram early, honey, I'm going to hunt that ram until the very last second, till it, it's, if it, it, you know. When it comes down to the last couple of days, I'm going to have to take another ram, but I am going to hunt it out until I find that special ram. And if you go into it, whether it's bucks, bulls, rams, if you take that mentality on every hunt, you know you, you're going to you're going to be you're going to harvest some big big animals. And you know if if just getting a nice representative species of the species is all you want to do that's fine too everybody's got their own thing but i've got a lot of listeners that are in both categories you know that are just hunting and just having fun and don't get all into it and then there's people that are you know want to really really trophy hunt and really be you know picky and try and do the best they can and harvest the best animal they can and you know the guys that that i look up to that that do the best and and shoot consistent big animals they're ones that just you know they go for it and they're willing to go home with nothing and they're willing to you know they know that animal's alive you know if you see a big giant you stick it out you keep looking and keep looking and keep looking and it's easy sometimes to uh you know like think that the animal's dead and oh he's dead a lion got him well the reality is no a lion probably didn't get him you just need to keep looking until you find him yep yeah and that and that's one thing that i'm that i plan on doing is hunting as much as i possibly can um and really going through as as much as of, of the land as i can to to find the the biggest and the oldest that i can find um, especially now that I have even a longer period of time, um, to hunt that, you know, it's, uh, you know, I have a chance for a lot of those rams to come off the park when it gets cooler. Um, so that's a possibility also. And that's one reason why I'll keep talking with everybody. Yeah. And um, I would say, don't get in a hurry. Um, you know, talk to it, talk to people and get advice from people that have hunted it. Talk to hunters that have hunted it. Um, and, and if they're telling you, Hey, don't get in a hurry, then don't get in a hurry. You know, if, if, but, but if you can, if you can know what's come out of there and know what's there, then you know, on opening day, when that Ram is standing in front of you and you're like, listen, this is the best thing I've seen. And it's bigger than any photos that I've seen. I need to jump on it, then jump on it. You'll know. If you've done your homework, you'll know when it's time to shoot. And, mm -hmm. you know, you may say, hey, I don't care about killing the biggest ram. I want to have the best time, and I'll, this is my time to sheep hunt. I want to take 14 days and just hunt. I may shoot the smallest ram on the last day. Fine. You, you are the tag holder. I'm not. Don't let me tell you what to do. You do what you want to do. It's your hunt. Um, and you are the one that decides which ram you want to kill. You are the one that decides how you want to hunt it. You are the one that decides how hard you want to hunt it. And enjoy it. It's your hunt, and it's a hunt of a lifetime. And you know, get your get 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 the full experience out of it. Definitely. Um, and there's one question that I I was sitting here thinking about. Um, 
I was thinking about taxidermy work. Um, is I, I would definitely want to get it uh, mounted once I get my my ram. Um, and I know that you're a guide, so I'm pretty sure that you probably skin your sheep out for your clients. Is there a certain way that you guys skin them out to be able to get the best uh, the best looking um, cape off the animal? Yeah. Now, are you talking life size or are you talking shoulder? Uh, both. So the answer is yes. Um, I would say that uh, I'm trying to think if I've got any videos on skinning a bighorn. If I don't, that's a great one to have. The one thing that I would tell you is you want to get the skin off. You want to get the hide off of it as quick as possible. Um, you don't want mm -hmm. the hair to slip, especially if you're hunting and it's warm. Um, get the thing in the shade if you can. Get your photos and everything taken and then get to working on it. Um, I, I would say who, whoever is your taxidermist. Now, Clay Goldman at Mogollon Taxidermy has mounted every single animal that I've ever harvested. He's probably mounted 80% of guys that have harvested sheep with me as well. I'm biased. I think he's the best desert bighorn taxidermist that I've seen. I think he does phenomenal work. But whoever you're using as a taxidermist, I would actually call him, which I have many times when um, going on hunts, talking to Clay, and have the actual taxidermist walk you through, here's what I want you to do. And, you know, I've done a bunch of them, and I can do it as good as anybody but it's always good to have refresher one thing i will tell you is like on the on the back side of the legs there's places where the the hair if it makes sense there's a point where the hair um it's kind of hard to explain but you want to make your cuts up the back of the leg right and then there's places mm -hmm. as you get up by the by going up the leg where there's longer hair and shorter hair and you want to make sure your cut is right in that angle or, or in that area, if that makes sense, so that when they yep. do so, um, that, that they're going to be in that area because the, the sheep are so thin-skinned, the hide is so mm -hmm. thin, you, you, know, you, you definitely want to be careful with that. Um, and uh, I would say if you're just doing a shoulder mount, you take, Take way more, and this applies to coos deer, applies to elk. Take way more of the hide behind the shoulder, because a, mm -hmm. a, a nice, uh, sometimes a nice pedestal mount, they can wrap that hide around the back. Um, and then be careful when you're caping it, because their hides are very thin compared to say an elk uh, or even yeah. a mule deer. Um, and and just go slow uh, and. I typically like to kind of do it and, you know, like Dar and I will work on one together. Uh, if, if your buddies that are with you are not as experienced, maybe have them hold the leg, but just take your time and try and be as meticulous as you can. Um, and anybody mm -hmm. out there, I would call your taxidermist. Um, some of the taxidermists, you know, they have little different tricks and stuff um, that they like and say, hey, make sure you do this. Um I would just tell you to take your time and go slow and then peel the animal if you can or do a dorsal where you cut right up the back and then peel everything from there if that makes sense. Yep. Peel up the back of the leg, peel up the dorsal. Um, now a lot of taxidermists will say, man, don't cut all the way from the base of the skull all the way down the back of the neck, you know, all the way back because that's so much sewing. You know, you can yeah. peel a lot of that. Um, it, you know, so I would, I would, it depends on which taxidermist you go to. I would specifically talk before the hunt with your taxidermist and say, how do you want it? I don't know if that answers yeah. your question. No, that does. That answers my question. Take your um, time, go slow, be meticulous, get the hide off as quick as you can. Yep. Do you use a, do you, do you use any certain type of knife for yourself? I always use a Havlon. Havlon Peranta. Um, they're okay. exchangeable blades. I've used them for a long time. There's probably other knives that are, you know, just as good. Um, I tell you, I use that Kestrel knife um, 
the the last ram i did uh caping around the bases um and i really like that kestrel i'm not sure which one it was but it's a it's a lightweight titanium knife um but overall a havlon peranta is hard to beat it's lightweight you can exchange the blades and it's very very sharp but with it being sharp and those thin hides you got to really really take your time um and, and you know go slow uh and and watch out that you don't you know make cuts that you shouldn't okay be careful like going up the back of the leg um uh for sure and tube as much of it as you can peel as much of it as you can if you know if you can if you can help from cutting all the way up the back of the leg just tube it you, you know what i'm saying start it and tube it yep. around the bottom of where the where the joint is in the hoof and then just tube it all the way back rather than cut up all the way up the back of the leg yeah yeah, that's that's usually how I do all my deers. I tube all their legs yeah, pretty much. It's tube it, and it's 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 taxidermists will like you better. <laughs> Most definitely. Um, I think that's uh, I think that's about it. Okay. Um, well, well, good. I'm stoked for your opportunity. Um, <laughs> and and anybody out there listening if you've got a hunt and you you know you're documenting rams and you need a second opinion i get emails all the time um happy to help you i'm 100 percent confidential don't share any information i'm happy to bounce back now keep in mind it's it's pretty it's subjective as far as if you send me a photo like you know what are the base sizes in that unit you know it could look like a big ram but bases the biggest bases in the unit are 14 and, and, a, and a quarter and you know but it looks like a, you know 15 and a half inch ram so every unit is different every every state is different every unit is different every ram is different you've got to use those baselines of okay this is in unit 16 d uh 16a in arizona or in 15d in arizona or unit 22 okay then i kind of have an idea okay there's never been a, a ram over 16 inch base in xyz unit okay so it's probably you know 14 and, a, and three quarters or 15 inch base you know and i can go from there um but mm-hmm. feel free to send me pictures if you want i can give you just a you know my guess um and i would encourage everyone out there when you send them to buddies that really don't know sheep they're like oh that's a monster that thing's a giant well um look at everything i try and nitpick everything not from a perspective of of being like um high and mighty but a perspective of trying to analyze and i never i i want to be as accurate as possible everyone's like oh you're Mm -hmm. all about score no I'm about being accurate. I want to be able to give an accurate assessment of what I think the animal scores. And, you know, being a guide, you have to do that. You have to give a score and you have to stick to it. And that's where knowing all of the measurements before you in that unit, like Matt, I literally keep charts of as far back as I can go, pictures of every ram that I can get my hands on data and say, you know, there's never been a ram in this unit that's had over 15 and a half inch bases. And somebody might be saying, oh, his bases look like they're 16. They're huge. Well, there's never been a ram with over 15 and a half inch bases. So I know that I'm never going to use more than 15 and a half, even if the ram looks like he's got super big, you know, giants. Or yeah. on the bottom side, like I said, you know, Every mature ram has at least 14 inch bases in this unit. Well, it's pretty safe that you can use 14 as your bottom end number. Oh yeah, definitely. So and document that, that's those. That's one rams. thing I'll be I'll be looking at a lot. Yeah, look at as many as you can, and it, you know if you shoot the biggest one you see, and it, you know depending on the unit, if you can look at 40 or 50 rams and you shoot the biggest one you see, you probably shot a pretty good one. Mhm. Yeah, and that's uh, I'm going for the oldest and the the oldest ram that I could possibly find, the biggest Good. if I can find that also. That's um, great. That that's fantastic that so. you're you know you're putting them in that order and go with the oldest, most mature, and then go with the biggest from there, and you're you're going to do just fine. 
Great. Um, so I got a question for you. Yep. Um, did you draw any tags in Arizona? I did not draw any tags in Arizona. Uh, did not draw any deer. Uh, did not draw sheep. Did you draw any in Arizona? Um, yeah, I did. Uh, I actually drew a uh, 12B West rut tag for for mule deer this year with my daughter. <laughs> you dirty dog. <laughs> so does that over? I'm trying uh, to think. That date, those dates don't overlap with your Zion hunt. No, no. But it starts uh, my. It's funny. My baby uh, is due on November 23rd, and the hunt starts on November 24th. Oh boy! Oh boy! <laughs> so your your hunt, your Zion hunt, ends on the 11th. <laughs> did you say 11th or 16th? Yeah, yeah. 11th. So it, uh, it ends on the 10th. You're you're hoping that the baby. Uh, doesn't come early enough that it uh, conflicts with that, but maybe comes a little bit earlier before the 12B West hunt. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I've i been up there in 12B West uh, one time. Uh, I don't want to come across as someone that knows that country at all, um, but I know yeah. that it's, it can be a very, very good tag. There's been some really nice deer shot out of there, and, um, you know, it's, it's a rut hunt, obviously. You should you know, being a mule deer nut, like you said, you are, it should be, uh, should be a really fun time. It's funny how sometimes these great hunts, you get two or three of them in the same year and you go through dry spells and don't get any tags. Um, and then all of a sudden you mm -hmm. get a couple, but, um, you, you know, you've probably gone long enough without having some good tags, you know, make the best of it. And, um, you know, I, I, I think, the same thing applies with that deer, you know, depending on what you're looking for. You sound like you killed a 184, I think you said. And, you know, yep. my mentality is like, okay, I've killed a 184. Let's see if I can beat a 184. You know, does that mean I'm looking for a 220? Sure, if it steps out in front of me. But, you know, yeah. <laughs> pretty hard if a, you know, solid 100 high 80s, low 90s buck, you know, right there in front of you steps out. It's pretty hard not to shoot that. And then the next hunt you draw, you can try and kill a you know, one a little bit better, and that's kind of how I've, how I've, um, you know, gone about is, is trying to kill something better than I've already killed, or, you know, for that unit, try and kill the most mature and the biggest animal that I can find, and I love hunting so much, I'm fine going, I went on that beaver hunt last year in, in Utah, one of the best units in Utah for elk, and hunted 16 mm -hmm. days, had one of the best public land elk hunting experiences of my life, and, and didn't kill a bull. Um, and people say, well, that was a, that was a bust, you know, you're probably disappointed. I'm like, I'm not disappointed at all. I had one of the greatest public land elk hunts I've ever had. Um, yep. so hopefully on that 12 B West hunt, you can, you can, uh, find a buck of your dreams and, and, uh, get it done. Yeah, I've got, uh, it's, it's funny. It's uh, we, I put us in as a group and so there's actually four of us with that tag. Golly, there's, unbelievable. There's, yeah, there's two, two of you, my daughter and then my buddy's son who are, it's their first, uh, big game hunt. So that's, uh, that's going to be pretty cool. awesome. One thing I'll give you some advice on that with the kids is make it as fun as possible. Don't make it about the trophies, make it about a nice solid deer and, and, you know, if you've got a you know a kid that really wants to you know find a big giant, you know, great. If not, make it fun. Don't let them get cold. You know, if it's super snowy and nasty, maybe they maybe they sit in the camp. You know, maybe you don't even go out that morning and make it fun. We we need as many kids in our sport as we can. We need to make it as fun as possible and make them want to come back and you know want to do it. Make it about you know driving on dad's lap or you know, cooking s'mores or, you know, hot dogs on the fire or, you know, collecting arrowheads or whatever, make it, you know, make it, make it fun out there to, to make them want to come and do it again. And I think it's so easy to, you know, you want a big deer. Well, you've got your tag, you know, let them enjoy the hunt. And, and, um, I, I think it's so important to, to make kids, let kids enjoy the hunt rather than trying to force it and you know make them enjoy what you like well you've got to show them a good time in order for that to happen exactly yeah and that's that's one thing i want to do with my daughter is just make sure that she has a great time and you know um not get on her for maybe not pulling the trigger fast enough 
you know, just make sure that she's comfortable and that she enjoys the entire the entire time. Yeah, and I think um, you, you know, work with work with the kids out there talking to all the listeners and you Matt you know work with the kids so that they're comfortable with their guns and sometimes just a nice good shot at a nice animal where they can make a nice shot and you go crazy and praise them and you know how awesome is this and just rather than some of those grinds you know the fastest way to make someone not like it is grind it out and grind it out because that you know they're not they're not at the point where you're at yet they're, they, they, they're just, yeah. this, you know, so sometimes just getting a nice buck in the crosshairs and boom, a nice one shot kill and being able to just go up and high five and, you know, be super excited and, you know, eat the back straps that night and just make it all about the experiences. What, pe- what keeps them coming back? I think. No, most definitely. So, well, any, any other questions you got there, bud? I think we covered a lot of ground. Um, it was, I'm super pumped about your opportunity there on the Zion. Oh yeah, I'm I'm super pumped. Uh, I couldn't uh, say enough. I, you know, uh, with Randy's help, it's it's been awesome. And then um, I met another guy by the name of Austin. Uh, he actually works for Hunt and Full, and he's helped me out quite a bit too. So awesome, um, good. Getting uh, getting information from people that just enjoy sheep hunting and are willing to give that information to you uh, it's really truly really helpful yeah so, uh, that's awesome uh, that you've got that support and you know continue to talk to people feel free to send me photos if you want i'm happy to give you my opinion uh the other thing about you know i kept saying document and and get info from rams that have been harvested in your unit that's fantastic also but then have a whole nother folder on your phone or on your ipad that's a bunch of other 165, 170, 172, you know, 175 Rams. It does you no good to look at 185 Rams that, you know, are probably not going to be in your unit. Look at Rams in other states and try and gather as much info as you can from other Rams that are similar size to maybe some that you're looking at. It doesn't do you any good to look at Mexicana photos because your sheep are Nelson I. So, Gather mm-hmm. as much intel and, you know, try and learn as much as you can about those ramps, you know, from 160 to, say, 175 um, and have a bunch of them on your phone uh, where you can use them and say, well, that ram has, you know, 15 and 2 eighths inch bases and it's, you know, 35 inches long and it scores, you know, 172 and it looks a lot like this ram. And w- when you do that... You, you know you're you're going to be that much further off when you're trying to judge as far as size and then certainly maturity of horn with dents and you know cuts and you know bumps in the horns and stuff um you know chips in the horns um that's going to be a good sign of maturity as well yeah uh, you know and i can't wait to continue to get out there and, and find those rams and that's one. That's one good thing about Instagram too is all the pictures that you see on Instagram of different uh, different rams and everything. That's one thing that I've I've been looking at, just trying to visualize. Uh, yep. Even glassing for them because you know the more you look at them, the more you're going to be able to spot them out there. Yeah, and and one bit of advice on glass and sheep is you glass faster than normal. Um, their yellow horn and their white butt sticks out cover as much country as you can and dodge and weave and move as much as you can don't get stuck in one spot move 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 glass fast glass efficient you know there's times when to slow down and really pick it out when they're bedded and what have you but those yellow horns stick out their white butts stick out if you don't see them keep moving with the mentality that you just got to keep moving till you find them um, you'll find certain areas that they kind of like to rut. You'll find certain areas that the ewes like to kind of hang out. Um, you'll, you know, but the, once you find a ram, most of the time he's going to be dodging and weaving and in and out, checking you groups, you know, and and running around like a wild man. That's been my experience. So um, cover as much country as you can and document and just keep moving. You, you, if you find a really nice ram, spend some good time with them, but then move on. Keep looking, keep looking, keep looking. Okay. 
Well, dude, I've been buddy. taking a lot of notes since we've been on the phone, so. Awesome. Well, well, um, I can't wait to see how you do, and um, I want to thank you for the opportunity. When you contacted me, I thought this would be a great opportunity for you know just to maybe you could ask questions that that. I could answer that you know that that other people have the same questions and and um, I uh, think it'll be good content where people can find some good value. I want to thank you uh, for uh, of this podcast and Matt. Uh, God bless you, buddy, and um, cheering for you and hope you do great. I know you will. It sounds like you're dedicated and really into it. Um, and um, you know, there's a bunch of people out there that are cheering for you to do really well. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. God bless you, too. All right, buddy. You take care. All right. Have a good one. All right. Bye. Bye.